to practice, uh, you know, what the orders are, what the myths are, in my opinion. I have some data from the force plates in our department, you know, gate lab. So it's based on some evidence, like you would think that aquatic therapy is joint unloading, but it's really not. It depends on how you use it. So, hmm. so, so I it's have okay if I keep, keep quiet, right? Huh? <laughs> Was that? So it's okay if I keep quiet. A very good evening to all. Uh, so as we get into one more invigorating journey and uh, knowing the wisdom of uh, Dr. Bhave, I guess he knows, needs no introduction. He's a clinical director at the rehab center at Sinai Hospital in uh, and Rubin's Center of Advanced Orthopedics in Baltimore. Um, and uh, he has co-authored as well as authored more close to about 100 articles. He is a recipient of many awards, including the Jacqueline Perry Award in 99, the IAP Oration Award in 2001, as well as the Champion of Care from Sinai Hospital itself in 2017. He's patented a lot of braces and has also been a co, co sorry, a co author to the Multiplier app, which I'm sure most of the orthopedics must be very well aware of. He has made custom devices for knee contractures, as well as uh, uh, extension brace, and uh, very lately combining the NMES uh, electrical stimulation to a brace and um, helping most of the post arthroplasty patients. He has also helped in development of a triage app, which helps in exercises for prehab as well as post rehab of arthroplasty patients. Uh, without spending too much time in the introduction, uh, there's also Dr. Nitish Bansal, who's joining us today, who's the Secretary for Society of Indian Physiotherapists. Uh, and we are very privileged to also have him in the panel today. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, so yeah. So without much ado, I think uh, we'll start with the presentation on a very, very interesting and um, uh, different topic, which uh, sir will enlighten us on. So thank you. Over to you, Bhavi, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think he'll have to rejoin. I see he is locked out somehow by mistake. Yes, I'm here. Uh, this uh, new Mac system doesn't allow screen recording, so I'm going to try again. I did no, no, but it's what's happening is uh, I did already. I, I re restarted my whole thing. Be good now. You can see the whole thing, right? I'm going to go start in the beginning. Okay. Everybody can see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, 
Well, thank you, Sona, and thank you, Nitesh, as well as Ashok, for uh, inviting me to give this interesting topic about uh, weight-bearing orders. Uh, we traditionally give weight-bearing orders in physical therapy many times uh, for avoiding extra weight on our lower extremity. And we use various devices uh, to protect our joints and our bones uh, from the stresses and strains of walking on the ground, uh, weight bearing. And there are various uh, techniques of weight bearing methods that are promoted. So what I wanted to do today was to, just to go a overview of what uh, some of these uh, treatment te techniques mean, uh, what really is the evidence, and what's been my personal experience uh, uh, looking at orthopedic patients over a spectrum of time. So what I did is this lecture is based on evidence as well as based on 40 years of my experience as a PT, and I have no financial benefits uh, directly or indirectly li linked to this lecture. So if you look at the weight bearing orders today that we give, uh, we can call it three point weight bearing, non weight bearing, touchdown weight bearing, partial weight bearing or weight bearing as tolerated. And what is that really? So a three point gate is crutches or two poles or two loft strand or elbow crutches or walker. And you're advancing the affected leg uh, with the devices that you are using. You can do a swing through gait and make it non-weight bearing, so you have no weight on the leg. You can do what we call touch down weight bearing with foot flat. You must keep your foot flat when you do this. It's called TDWB, which is touch down weight bearing, and it's uh, considered better than other weight bearings for early postoperative patient, and we'll explain that. Partial can be touchdown weight bearing, it can be 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, 70%, or 100%. Weight bearing is tolerated, is really defined as a person's ability to accept the weight of the, of the body as much as he can tolerate. So if there is pain or instability, the patient will use less weight bearing through the leg, more through the crutches or walker or uh, cane. And then, and then they can go on with their life. And if the pain is more, they can reduce the weight bearing. If the pain is less and they feel more stable, they increase the weight bearing. That's called weight bearing as tolerated. A two-point weight bearing is, is a cane walking. A four-point gait is one that is like a Nordic walking. What's a Nordic walking? Very simply to explain, and you can rhyme this, Left crutch, right leg, right crutch, left leg. I can say that again, left crutch, right leg, right crutch, left leg. If you say that to the patient, they get it very quickly. It rhymes very nicely and they get the idea that it's Nordic walking or people who uh, know cross-country skiing is like a cross-country skiing. But you can also restrict the weight bearing by bed rest and or you can do bed rest with transfers only. So these are all the different methods that we use for uh, avoiding harmful stresses on the joint. So let's go over that and see what that really means for the patients. So why we use walking aids and restrict weight bearing? We use it to protect healing tissue from excessive internal forces, reduce pain by sparing inflamed tissue from the joint reactive forces. A common walking aids that we use are walker, axillary crutches, loft strand or elbow crutches, walking poles or Nordic poles that are very popular now, canes, they could have a single support, they could have a quad support. And then we also use braces, walking boots and orthotics to make sure that uh, we can protect the joint and reduce the joint reactive force. So we need to understand first what these internal forces are on the joint as why are we trying to reduce the weight on the lower extremity and how do we reduce pain by sparing inflamed tissue from those joint reactive forces. Any force on a inflamed tissue, synovium, tendon, ligament will cause more pain. 
Axial loading usually doesn't cause pain. It is usually the torsional forces, the shear forces are, and stresses that cause more pain. And the, the question then becomes, how do we avoid these? And that's what this lecture is all about. And does it really do it? So if you look at the, the Google and do an image search, you will see that there are various types of walkers. All the walkers, and this design has not been changed since World War I. This design hasn't changed. So it's a four uh, supports. And then you advance the walker every step and you can do a non-weight bearing or you can do touchdown weight bearing or you can do partial weight bearing with the walker. A Little bit more advanced here is when you have a rolling walker where you have front wheels and back legs and you can roll it without lifting it, you can advance your leg and walk. These are usually not suited for non-weight bearing gait, but they are okay for weight bearing gait, uh, partial weight bearing gait. These are really supportive. They have all four wheels, so they cannot do any restricted weight bearing much. They can support 10, 15% of the body weight, but they are really meant for as a bilateral support, as a mobility. Then are the crutches here. The crutches are again, axillary crutches. That design again is since World War I. And then more advanced is this uh, concept of uh, axillary with a little bit different support, or you have elbow crutches, which is very popular in uh, Europe. Uh, where uh, they are not hurting your axilla or brachial plexus, and we call them elbow crutches. And again, the single point cane is here. You can also have a quad cane or a tri cane, which is all basically a cane with different supports. And the last one here is the, the Nordic pole. I particularly like this for my hip patients, uh, and I will explain what my rationale is for that. So, Remember this, that correct weight bearing helps with, and why we do this, is it helps with bone growth. It reduces muscle wasting or delays atrophy of the most lower limb muscles. It improves circulation and strengthens tendons and other dense connective tissue. And what I mean by dense connective tissue is all of the tissue that is not contractile element, meaning the tendon, the ligaments, the fascia, etc. So weight bearing has tremendous benefits uh, in terms of uh, uh, bone growth if done correctly. Muscle wasting is very important. It's the simplest exercise that one can do to delay muscle atrophy, even in geriatric patients, as well as in patients who are uh, restricted in weight bearing. The weight bearing becomes critical. It improves circulation because it allows for muscles to work better and there's a homeostatic effect leading to strengthening of the biological tensioning of the tendons and other tissues. But when we weight bear, we are subjected to what we call internal forces or joint reactive forces. We are also subjected to tensile stresses and shear forces. And this is an example of uh, two of the, of the internal forces or we call it joint reactive forces. An internal force experienced by the joint at the surface when joint is subjected to external loads such as ground reaction force vectors and internal loads such as ligament and muscle action. So what I mean by that is there is always an equal and opposite reaction. And the internal forces are the one that cause, can cause pain, especially if you have had surgery or you have had injury. So why does it? Because there's, a, there's a, a joint reactive force. There's a body weight to be balanced here in the hip joint. Now the abductor lever arm is only one time distance from this. So it produces twice the amount of body weight force. And this results in internal force that is experienced by the acetabulum and the femoral head. Uh, and that we call joint reactive force. Similarly, in the knee joint, you have the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius force, the quadricep force, ligament force, and the ground reaction force. And there's an internal force that we call joint reaction force for the knee, for the tibiofemoral joint. And then you also have joint reactive force for the patellofemoral joint that's a separate. So we all have to consider all this in the ankle, the same thing, uh, that there is going to be internal forces that are produced. Well, how much are they and how are they design. So this is just another example of what the joint reactive force could be. 
So you have a 3x distance. Let's say you, are, you have a offset and you have a 3x distance in your lever arm here. Then you are going to produce almost four times body weight joint reactive force. So if you weigh 100 kilos, you're producing 300 to 400 kilos of force on your acetabulum and your femoral head. That's a lot of force. So we have to consider what our strategies are for protecting these patients from abnormal weight bearing. This is another example of the same thing in walking. If you look at this, this is a joint reaction force at the hip joint. And what does it do? At heel strike, it is about two times body weight. As you go through the stance phase, it keeps on increasing up to six to seven times body weight force in the mid stance phase, a terminal stance phase. And I'm gonna explain that to you a little better. Even during swing phase, there is some joint reactive force going on all the time. And our cartilage and our bone structures are designed so beautifully that they can absorb a lot of joint reactive force. For example, running can lead up to 13 to 15 times body weight force on the hip joint reaction force. But people run for marathons and they don't have problem. But if they have articular cartilage defect or a liberal defect, then you feel it right away. And weight bearing is provocative. It actually tells you what is happening to your, your joint better than a clinical examination alone, because clinical examination, you cannot stress the joint, load the joint like you do with weight bearing and increased weight bearing tells you a better story. So if you look at this carefully, and this is important slide because this is therapy approach that we can take. So the hip joint reaction force during level surface walking and normal speed, okay? So if you look at it, it's, uh, you know, joint, the joint angle is here. This is our stance phase of the, of the gait cycle. And this is our swing phase of the gait cycle. And it starts at about three times body weight where there's first heel strike and there's deceleration or contraction of the gluteus maximus is done. But as the body transfers over, as you come from a, a initial stance to terminal stance and you're pushing off, it can go up to six times body weight. So what's the strategy people use? They just don't do the terminal stance. They keep the hip flexed. By keeping the hip flexed, you are able to reduce joint reactive forces in your, in your hip joint. Even in swing phase, you are facing about one-time body weight forces throughout the joint. So what is speed of walking and hip joint reaction force up to lead to? So this is a this is a, a, a slow, slightly slow speed of walking, and you are producing 1,100 newtons of internal force on a on a on a guy who weighs average weight, and 1.3 meters, which is not a whole lot. It's not a lot of increase in speed. You produce 1,700. So just speed increases your uh, joint reaction force. So there's a 44% increase in speed leads to about 54% increase in joint reactive force. So speed is another variable that we can consider as a therapeutic approach uh, for managing the increase in, in, in forces on the joint. Why do we care about all these things? Because we want to protect the surgery. We want to protect uh, the implant. We want to protect the cement bone interface. And you know the new cementing techniques and the amount um, that, uh, that, that curing of the cement occurs with the hip joint replacement, these are not that important. Uh, they, they are usually, but in a geriatric fracture, they are very important factors. An osteoporotic patient, they are very important factors. Hip joint reaction force in bed. This is my favorite slide. So if you are taking a, if you put patient on a bed rest, but if you allow the patient to move in bed rest, you're not really taking weight of the hip joint at all. And this is an example of that. So this is an act of using bedpan. So you're basically elevating your leg, you're doing a single leg bridge, that like most therapists understand this, and you're lifting the leg up and you are elevating your hips to get a bedpan under your, your uh, buttocks and you are basically producing a 68 kilograms of force on an average body weight or 670 newtons. If you use a trapeze and get little assistance to get a bedpan, 
you reduce it significantly by 350% reduction in joint reactive forces. So just putting a patient on a bed rest does not mean that you are really taking the weight of the leg, uh, of the weight is actually significant, even for simple activity as taking a bed pack. Now I want the therapist to think like this because it is very customary to do bed exercises uh, for patients. And I'm going to show you what that means, but just to, just to empower you, remember that every time you do a sideline hip abduction or a straight leg raise, you are imparting three to five times body weight forces, depending on the amount of force the patient exerts to lift that leg up. So there is significant, and that is just the weight of the leg. If you add weights to that, it even increases. So doing bedside exercises and not considering this factor is very important in my opinion. It is better to not have patients do strict bed rest for managing a hip problem or a knee problem or ankle problem. And I'll show you what I mean by that. This is another example. Uh, these are all uh, based on evidence. Uh, so if you look at uh, a low chair with the cane. If you see this act of this man here, trying to get up from a low chair, very commonly done. They don't have an armrest anywhere here nearby. So the poor guy has to get up like this. You're exerting eight times body weight forces. This is when the most dislocations of the hip after hip replacement occur. Uh, this is when they get a lot of pain. And this is eight times body weight forces. Now, if the same man was sitting in a higher chair, he would only put three to four times body weight forces. And a regular chair with arms, he would only put one to two times body weight force. So it's important to have a simple thing like a good chair for patients who are recovering from hip surgery, a chair that is slightly higher than regular chair or put a pillow underneath their butt so that they can get up easier. And having arm, arm rest would be important for them to reduce the, that kind of impact on their hip joint and it's important for healing. Correct weight bearing and, and appropriate weight bearing is important for healing. Excessive weight bearing and pain and inflammation is bad for healing. So that's something that we have to always remember. So going to the knee, uh, if you look at this, look at the knee for walking, you apply about three times body weight force at heel strike and then you have what we call loading response knee flexion. Loading response knee flexion is a shock absorption strategy. It's also energy conservation strategy in gait. What happens with that is you reduce your, your, uh, your G-joint reaction force. Now, what I'm talking about mainly is tibiofemoral. And there is also a patellofemoral strategy that I'll show you. You reduce it to two times body weight. Again, at push-off, it increases to three times body weight. And swing phase, you have 0.5 to 1%. Uh, times body weight forces at the tibiofemoral joint. So this is very important for, for health of our joint. And if you look at the normal, every abnormal patient that has a knee problem normally walks with a stiff leg gait. They, they think that protection of the stiff leg is better than allowing the flexion for the tibiofemoral joint. Why do they do that? because there is always a concomitant patellofemoral strategy and they have a problem with loading that and we'll explain that to you in a second. But it is very important to restore a normal gait pattern so that you actually encourage the joint shock absorption as shown here. This becomes equally important as you walk faster. This is normal speed. With walking faster, it can be up to five times and two and a half to three times body weight. So it becomes very important that we have that loading response knee flexion, which is about 20 degrees of knee flexion during uh, initial stance to mid stance phase, which becomes critical. Well, what happens when you don't have that or what called stiff legged gait? Look at here, this is the normal gait where you have a reduction in the forces and increase in forces, but there's actually a cyclical impact of the cartilage but you have stiff legged gait, you have continuous loading. So you have continuous loading of the knee joint on normal, and as you increase the speed, it becomes worse. Now, what does that relate to? It relates to a multiplier effect. Everything is a multiplier effect in the human body. 
If you do this, and let's say your stance phase is about 0.6 seconds, but you're doing this type of load, increased load with low, no shock absorption for 3 million steps a year, or 3 to 4 million steps a year. That's a lot of steps, and this is for disease. 3 to 4 million steps is not what you and I do. We do a lot more than that. So there's a continuous overload on the articular cartilage, uh, especially in the, in the regions that it's not supposed to be all the time weight bearing. And thus you can get articular cartilage degeneration, early osteoarthritis and other problems. So normalizing gait and reducing the joint reactive forces is a very critical strategy in changing patient's disease profile and actually can be disease modifying for many of the degenerative diseases of the joints. Because then you allow for appropriate shock absorption. So it's a combination of muscle firing strategy with the correct movement pattern to allow for a better loading of the articular cartilage. That's my take home message. And that's how I have always practiced without depending on just the disease, I'm depending more on the movement pattern and the strategy and muscle activation pattern that becomes critical for normalizing the gait. This is about patellofemoral joint, and this is gets a little complex because what happens with patellofemoral joint is there are four steps in the contact of the patella to the femur. And in full extension, it is really up here and doesn't really impact the articular cartilage. But at two step, two points, it is in close contact. One is at the initial stance flexing, then the knee starts flexion to extension again, then at terminal stance and at initial heat strike again. So those are the times that it's in, in contact. So to reduce the patellofemoral stress, we have to keep the knee uh, straighter. And then we have to reduce the inflammation around the patellofemoral joint so that they can actually do the loading response and the flexion. So it becomes a little bit challenging when you're managing a tri-compartmental tri disease when you have both the uh, medial and lateral compartment and your uh, patellofemoral joint, it becomes a little complex. So all arthritis is patellofemoral and tibiofemoral, but if you can manage patellofemoral and get better normal rhythm of your walking, you're doing some good to the articular cartilage is my opinion. What is the role of quadricep muscle force and flexion on the patellofemoral joint reaction force? Well, you can see that. As the knee flexion increases and quadricep muscle force increases, the joint reaction force increases significantly. And in, in, the, in the, this range of hyperflexion, 40 to, 40 to uh, 60 and above, it actually is tremendous amount of joint reactive forces up to 2,000 to 2,500 newtons of force is applied. Uh, to the patellofemoral joint. So working in this range uh, when patellofemoral joint with tibiofemoral joint is inflamed is very critical uh, in terms of how you treat a patellofemoral disease and the joint reactive forces. Uh, this is about a patient. This is really interesting. Uh, this is people who donate their life and their, uh, their leg to science. This is actually an orthopedic surgeon who allowed his total knee implant to be a measuring device also. They put a strain gauge in his total knee and they were able to monitor uh, how much uh, force there is on the, on the tibiofemoral joint when you do certain activities, including stair climbing. So uh, what you see here, and I have highlighted in red, is that in healthy patients, you have 3.2 plus or minus 3.4 uh, of compressive force uh, uh, early stance and the late stance is 3.9. And total knee is subjected to almost the same amount, uh, 2.7 and 3.9 of force on the joint. So my personal preference is for two reasons, is I never allow a reciprocating stair climbing on patients who have had knee replacement for up to four weeks. Because my rationale is the tissues are inflamed. The, there is, though there is a quad sparing surgery, there is tremendous stress on the quadriceps when you go up and down the stairs in the reciprocal gait. So I encourage my patients to do one step at a time or protecting the leg. So 
up with the good, down with the bad type of strategy on all my knee surgery patients for at least four weeks. I test them for isometric strength. I test them for joint stability. I test them for reduced tissue response in terms of inflammation before I allow them I allow them reci uh, reciprocating gait. So, um, sorry about that. That was my hospital calling. Uh, so, uh, so uh, th that is a strategy that I have particularly found clinically very useful is sometimes we are too aggressive with our patients in terms of stair climbing. And I believe that actually more harm is done because what happens with total knee patients or certain other orthopedic conditions like a plate or intraarticular fracture is that if you're too aggressive with stair climbing or doing deep, deep bending activities with load on the joint, the tissue homeostasis doesn't occur. What I mean by tissue homeostasis is the tissue needs time to heal. There's a biological process. And by adding this kind of joint reactive forces, we may be doing more harm to the tissue than good for be just being too aggressive unnecessarily. And there's nothing uh, damaged by waiting for four weeks or even six weeks, depending on the patient. That's the same reason I don't put patients on a, on a uh, significant weight-bearing activity, not, not, sorry, not weight-bearing, uh, significant weight training activities in the first six weeks of surgery or from a trauma, because the same thing happens in them. The tissue needs to heal before it causes more inflammation. And I believe that we have to recognize that as a problem. This becomes a serious problem in patellofemoral surgeries. This becomes a serious problem with some of the total knees that are non-cemented, even bigger problems. But overall, my approach always has been that we have to protect the patient from themselves and ourselves for four to six weeks before we go further. So, and the rationale is based on this, uh, this orthopedic surgeon who actually subjected himself to types of forces that he shouldn't be subjected to himself. Well, this is the prediction. Uh, and uh, this is very, very critical. This is again done in uh, a total knee patient with doing uh, instrumented total knee published in 2010, 2020, re recent article. Um, sorry, if it's 2020 or what is it? I don't remember now. But anyway, uh, if you look at it, and you see very carefully, walking is less than playing golf. Jogging is of course more than walking. Treadmill walking is actually lesser than regular walking in terms of forces on the knee joint. So tennis and golf are two things that we recommend our patients very quickly. <laughs> Those are the ones that cause more joint reactive forces than walking on a treadmill or even power walking or stationary bicycle, uh, stairmaster, elliptical level bike, even a leg press, even a rowing machine. So, so my point here is that we have to we have to remember what we are dealing with. And this, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a slide on this. I somehow couldn't get that actual slide. But there has been a paper uh, that is published for the hip joint, the similar way that uh, shows that golf, uh, important, I mean, not important, but as uh, injury preventive, as we think it is, because the external rotation torque on the hip joint, the trailing leg can be as much as 10 to 13 percent or 13 times body weight. So not, not everything that we believe is actually true based on some of the new literature in terms of uh, implanted prosthesis and what it is showing. So remember that. And how do you know as a clinician what is good and what is not? Listen to your patient because abnormal forces lead to pain and inflammation. Don't push them past a point if this starts having inflammation and pain. This is a special take home message for my therapy friends, not my surgeon friends, is that by doing things without thought, you can actually cause more delay in recovery from surgery uh, and, or, and or from injury. 
And uh, we have to always think about the joint reactive forces uh, as an important factor in all of this. This is work of Kim Bennell uh, from Australia. Uh, and what it shows is that it depends on how you use the cane. Not all cane is same you, you use of cane. You can put body weight support of 20%, 15%, and 10%, and they actually measured it in the gate lab. Or you can be unaided. And if you look at the joint reactive forces, if you use the 20% support on the contralateral side, you actually have reduced joint reactive forces significantly as compared to a normal gait. And it is very dose dependent, meaning depending on how much pressure you apply on your opposite side uh, on the cane determines how much you will unload your knee joint. And this is a very important piece of information for therapists who, you know, giving cane to a patient when you have knee joint problems is a very common thing. We all do it, right? But how many times do we educate the patient to push down on the cane and how much they should push down on the cane? How do you know? Is it 10% of body weight support, 20% or 30%? And how do you know that? Well, it's very simple. If you use a, a, a $5 device, it's called weighing scale, bathroom scale, you can actually have patients feel what is 10%, 20%, 30% body weight support. You can also use that uh, when they are weight bearing. For example, if you're doing partial weight bearing, if you're allowing 50% weight bearing because you think that that doesn't cause the inflammation or pain, how do they know they are putting 50% down every step they take? Well, there's something called biofeedback. Well, the mirror and the weighing scale or the bathroom scale are the two best biofeedback methods. So what does the weighing scale do? Well, you go to the bathroom, you stand on your weighing scale one leg at a time, one leg and one leg supported by something else. And you push down slowly until you feel half your body weight, 40% of your body weight, 30. And you do it multiple times, but you do it in axial loading. You don't do it any other way. And what you, what you get that from that is a biofeedback training for that patient that you can use. You can use the same thing with the cane. You can actually tell the patient how to find out how much cane. Most patients will do is when they are in pain, they'll push down too hard. Well, too hard doesn't help because you can have carpal tunnel syndrome, you can have rotator cuff injuries. So all that is also equally important. The other strategy is to move the cane away from the body. And if you do that, then you reduce the stresses on the hip joint and the knee joint also. So that's another strategy. And you know about the Tendrillenberg strategy where trunk is leaning over to reduce uh, the uh, distribution of weight on the hip, knee, and ankle. So that's another strategy. That's a limping gait, which is not very uh, nice for the patients. Uh, they, don't, you know, they don't like it. Uh, we try to avoid it, but using a cane is uh, very important. And there's a great article that was published in British Journal a long time ago called Don't Throw Your Cane Away Too Quickly. And I, I really I believe in that. It's hard to sell it to our patients, but uh, it's important that we keep that in the back of our mind. And this is, this is a, a good uh, research paper done by Kim Benell. Uh, at, uh, in, I think she's in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and it showed very elegantly what, uh, what they have done in terms of cane pressure and the weight bearing or the joint reactive forces offset. This is my favorite slide because we all think that when we tell the patients to go do pool therapy, aquatic therapy, everything is great. And then we have three activities that we do. We do non-weight bearing activities where the foot is not touching the ground. But then we are doing some weight bearing, partial weight bearing. We're walking in the water. We're doing other things. And uh, we are also doing some non-weight bearing uh, with resistance. So we are, we are fashionable to wear fins. We wear all kinds of things. And then we do some dynamic activities in water. And all of these are highlighted down here. Jumping lunges, jumping jerks, uh, hip flexor, uh, fast twitch, all these exercises that we do. And then here is my normal, normal body weight, walking, just walking, simple walking. I'm going to see if I can move this uh, uh, 
uh, a video down here so I can see it. Okay, that's good right there. Okay. So uh, if you see here, that's normal, that's green. So what I did is I drew a, a, a kind of a uh, box around what the normal is. And if you say the dynamic exercise can produce actually greater joint reactive forces in the water. non weight bearing resistance exercises are almost same as walking. So the benefit of water therapy is here in this. non weight bearing activities without resistance or some weight bearing activities, limited weight bearing activities. If you're subjecting patient to this, you're not protecting the joints. You're better off doing this and then gradually increase the weight bearing here. So how we use water for the hip replacement or a hip patient is also important. And I gave you a reference down here. It's published uh, recently, actually. And uh, it shows it's 2017. Does aquatic exercise reduce hip and knee joint loading? And they again did the same thing. They did calculation of joint forces. And they found that it depends on how you use the water. Just throwing a patient in the water doesn't really uh, do the job. It's how you use the water. And does it happen same for the, for the knee? Is This is for the knee. And again, same thing. Knee is a little bit different. It's the dynamic activities that are equal, but then everything else is better. So the knee replacement patients can even do weight-bearing activities in the water and still have protective effect on the water, while as a dynamic activity, the water is not. So it depends on how you use water exercises. Not telling the patient to just go do water therapy is not enough, in my opinion. We have to scale it down. What about the ankle joint? Same thing. We have an initial stance about one times body weight, and then at the loading response, I'm sorry, loading response is about two and a half times. And the terminal stance is up to five times body weight. And running can be up to 13 to 15 times body weight forces. So significant body weight forces are transferred on the ankle joint. So that's important. So we have known this for a while, right? That walking with the cane reduces hip joint contact force on the contralateral side by 55 to 60%. It doesn't eliminate it. It only reduces it. So without the cane, you have 3.4 average force. And with cane in the opposite hand, it's about 2.2 times body weight force. So there's a, some reduction, about 50 to, 55 to 60% reduction. And this is a common, common technique we used. One of the problems we get is people think that it is 50% load reduction. It is not. Load is different on the leg that is felt on the foot. Joint reaction force is what is reduced in the hip joint. So walking with a cane only reduces by 50% joint reactive force in the hip joint and protects the hip joint from joint reactive forces that cause loosening of the prosthesis, loosening of the uh, plate, nail, or reduces inflammation. It does not reduce the load by 50%. Why do I say that? Well, this is a very old picture from a book. And if you can see here, it's already given here. You, when you load with your contralateral cane, you're putting four fifths of your body weight on your leg. But you do produce, you do reduce your joint reactive forces by about 50%. And more the more the cane moves, more laterally you reduce it further. So I have been looking at this very carefully in the in the gate lab. So what do I see in the gate lab is very simply is if this is the normal walking, this is a crutch in the opposite hand, and this is a cane in the opposite hand, what you see is from the peak, there's about 10 to 15% reduction of the load, not the joint reactive force, on the foot is about 10 to 15% only. So the cane is not as therapeutic for the knee or ankle joint as is, is for the hip joint. So we cannot just correlate that and say, oh, you're walking with a cane, that means you're putting 50% load on the leg. That's not true. We actually put only 10 to 15% of loading of the joint. So that's a very important concept to remember. I show this to my therapist 
because it's very important that they understand this concept of load versus joint reactive forces and we all need to understand that so how should i use the cane if i have a foot and ankle problem you can use the cane in the same hand as an involved foot and try to lean over to the cane to try to reduce weight to the ankle and foot and i don't know if you've seen this some patients when they are in acute pain they like to use the cane in the same hand especially if they have a problem below the knee joint line i have seen that problem is it causes significant asymmetry in gait and shift and causes torsional forces and stresses your back compared to the cane in the same hand cane in the opposite hand puts less stress on your back and produces more symmetrical gait so you have to choose which is better i personally don't recommend uh, a, a contral a same a same hand cane in most patients because i would like to rather use unweight unloading strategy like a like a ankle boot and a cane in the opposite hand which would be my better strategy because it gives you a symmetrical gait and doesn't call all this extra problems but there is this strategy that you can use like a cane in the cane or crutch in the same hand temporarily to offset the weight on the leg and cane in the same hand as affected side this is a force plate tracing this is again the peak of peak joint loading here peak limb loading and you can see here it can reduce by 35 to 40% weight on the leg so this force plate tracing is of the leg while as cane is next to it but we didn't measure the cane force we only measured the leg, leg force of the leg load and the leg experience is about 35 to 40% load when you are using the cane in the same hand versus in the opposite hand the leg experience is about 85% of the load uh in that hand the one thing that i did not uh, focus on too much was the touch down weight bearing and what's the value of touch down versus non weight bearing when you do non weight bearing and this is particularly important for the for the hip joint is you are producing significant loads on the hip joint in terms of joint reactive forces because to maintain a not weight bearing position you have to keep your knee flexed your hip flexed and that produces muscle action against gravity and that leads to increased joint reactive forces when you do a touch down weight bearing which is basically you are using the weight of the leg to be supported by the ground so for example usually our if you are 100 kilos in weight our leg weighs about 11 kilos so you can train the patient to apply a 11 kilos of force on the weighing scale to train them to be able to only do touch down weight bearing with foot flat it's important to not keep the foot in equinus so when you do foot flat touch down weight bearing you don't need muscle activation and because you don't need muscle activation a touch down gait is far more less injurious to the hip joint than a non weight bearing gait and it's definitely much better than trying to do exercises in bed so i truly believe in that and if we have hip joint pathology to protect the hip joint until the inflammation is reduced the healing is occurring is very important in my opinion and these are simple things but they can make a big difference in somebody's life and i think that's very important to remember about bed pan uh, taking the bed pan exercises in bed versus uh, exercises uh, in standing versus touch down weight bearing versus a non weight bearing and the last thing i want to talk about is the what we call fatigue failure of the implants in a previously well fixed implant and this goes responsibility of this goes on the therapist and the patient and i'll tell you why and i have seen examples of this a fatigue failure of implant remember this when the implant is applied the implant is taking a load share it's a load sharing device it takes load of the bone and of the of the muscles and cart so it's taking some load of the bone not cart bone so it's load sharing but it has its own fatigue every every metal or every material has a fatigue factor 
but there's more to it than this i truly believe that when we move from a unilateral it's a bilateral support to unilateral support and if there is pain muscle weakness and laxity it will cause more stresses on the implant so if the patient has increased torsional forces or increased bending moments around the femur if it's a plate bending moment around the femur and they are using a unilateral force the chance of fatigue failure of the implant is significantly higher so we have to why is it that we have to go from double support to single support i understand you want to go from a walker to crutches or walker walker to walking pole but why would you go to a cane when you are producing torsional forces if you are weak or you have pain uh, or you have significant laxity i don't understand that so i truly believe if the if the gait is abnormal with a single point cane i don't want to advance them and i want to advance them from more into a more walking normal pattern and then change their they sometimes some of my patients i don't advance them to cane at all i go from bilateral supports to nothing because i put them in uh, a a three point gait or partial weight bearing touch down partial weight bearing full weight bearing as tolerated maybe before that i advance them to a four point gait left crutch right leg right crutch left leg or two canes and then i get them nothing so i truly believe that one of the reasons why we have fatigue failures is of course osteoporosis uh, implant is not fixed well all those are orthopedic surgeons problems but when it comes to a therapist hand if you have pain significant muscle weakness and laxity don't be too aggressive to move people from bilateral support to unilateral support though it may sound terrible for the patient i am telling you trust me it's protective and it will they will people will thank you in long run so that's something that we have to always remember when we are advancing people from uh, bilateral to unilateral support and this is the this is the the diagram of it's not just and this is sized in the physical therapy literature when you have a implant in the leg or when you are stressing the leg the factor of every implant and it's based based on number of cycles and stress amplitude so if you and you're causing a stress on a plate or the implant in your bone and you're doing 10000 steps a day versus 1000 steps a day is of course you know that and there is everything has a failure point and there's an equation for that and i'm sure like for i am nail for internal nail we know now no if it's a 8.5 mm nail or above between 10 mm and 8.5 they don't need to do more than 1000 steps it can be full weight bearing but don't do more than 1000 steps so there are definitions like that for everything and what i have to tell you is that you don't need to know that what you need to know is that it's not just the weight bearing or the it's also number of cycles per day that we can have to calculate the failure of the implant lifting your number of steps and increasing the load is another strategy that one can do in the progression of the patient in weight bearing from starting from a uh, a, a, a lesser weight bearing Uh, and gradually increasing the weight bearing but limiting the number of number of repetitions that one does and that's a it's a good strategy and this is where the 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 today's uh, new world will be affected because you can use a very cheap step pedometer and measure number of steps that patients can do and you can really get this uh, down to a science and not just to oh whatever you want you can do i think that's a very wrong approach to take on a patient with an implant this is my personal observation the effect of use of cane and crutches on upper extremity this is a problem and that's why we have to be careful how we use it and that's where my thought process of uh, you know limiting uh, total number of steps especially in a very active patient so this is what i have seen in my patients at some point if they are habitual users then the shoulder pain 37% of the patients elbow pain 9% and 50% of some wrist and finger pain problem is lot of these people are arthritic and they they have wrist and finger problems anyway so it's very difficult to tell whether it's just from use of uh, crutches or cane and then in the foot the last thing i want to talk about is in the foot we have a tripod of weight bearing we have a 
particular uh, weight bearing through heel, which is very balanced and central. Then we have a transfer of weight through the lateral foot into the metatarsalates, and then eventually onto the uh, into the great toe. That's the normal foot progression uh, that we have to maintain. It's the tripod of walking. It's important to maintain those arches. I'm not going to. It's a, it's a separate lecture on this. What I'm trying to tell you is there are various methods of unloading the putibalis posterior tendon, for that matter. When you have significant inflammation or inflammation of the tendon, you can actually use orthotics and wedges to your advantage to unload the tendons. We do unloading taping uh, with kinesio tape or with McCollar taping and using orthotics and proper shoe wear or braces is similar to that in terms of unloading the tendon um, for weight bearing. And we can also use these type of shoes. Uh, these are diabetic shoes here. Many people use this. And the reason you want to use proper shoes for diabetics is that you can avoid an ulcer and amputation if you take good care uh, of, uh, of your foot. Uh, this is a strategy used for any inflammation or fractures, small fractures around the ankle joint to unload the joint. Do not have that stresses on the joint in terminal stance because terminal stance is five times body weight. Well, as if you unlock your joint and have the air scar support like this, or a rocker bottom shoe, or a total unweight bearing like this, you can you can create the strategies out of bracing, out of uh, everything. I have just just touched on the surface of this this whole concept, and uh, you know each joint needs its own consideration. So I don't I I don't want to tell you that I could tell you everything, but I, what I want to tell you in the end is a summary of this. I want to think about load on the leg versus joint reactive forces. What the exercise does to the joints and how to avoid it is important. Shear is when the joint is in subluxating mode. So shear is bad for the, for the joints and for the ligaments and for tendons. Torsional forces are bad. The bending moment especially is bad for like a femoral plate where there is a bending moment, like a varus moment on it. And remember, the tissue and implant fatigue is an important concept, and we need to monitor that well. And now, I tell you, is based on uh, all of it is science. Now, this is my total personal evidence. So I will stop here, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, topic. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, sir. Very enlightening talk as usual. Uh, I would like you to just repeat. Uh, you told one point about uh, how you use uh, only the touchdown uh, foot uh, to kind of and progress it to nothing. You know, I mean, in the sense you do not use much of cane as a uh, in between stage between the walker and going on to nothing. So, what sequence do you follow? So, if you could so just for, for a patient uh, for a patient who needs touchdown weight bearing, yes. they re need it because they either have a non-cemented prosthesis, mm -hmm. partial cemented prosthesis, they have a tenuous osteoporotic fractures, mm -hmm. uh, plates and screws. So touchdown weight bearing is difficult for older people. So God forbid if they get like liberal injuries, femoral acetabular surgeries are younger. So you can use this strategy really well. The strategy is very simple where you take them, you train them for what is touchdown weight bearing, which is 10 to 15% yes. of the body weight, which has absolutely no joint reactive forces. So it's a much safer mechanism for the first four to six weeks of healing. If they need it. So then you progress it on to a uh, four-point gate and then you, you just say, not go to a No, I then I progress to, I, I personally progress my patients from there to a weight-bearing as tolerated three-point gate or a four-point gate. Okay. By then the tissue homeostasis has occurred and then I transfer them to nothing because by then I'm exercising them enough. Now, okay. if I have to use a cane, if I have to use a cane, mm -hmm. I will use it, but many times I'll, I have them use it at only outside. And the reason I use it because we have slippery ground or snow and stuff like that. 
So I like to give them some protection <laughs> and patients prefer that. So that's my, that's my progression for my younger patient. Okay. For my older patient, we like to use walkers for them for stability. Okay. We are older, like geriatric patient. Mm -hmm. We use that. For uh, them, doing touchdown weight bearing is almost impossible. Sir, we use, I mean, I saw a lot of use of rollators in the US, you know, Correct. not so, very common in India as yet. I mean, so use, rollators allow you full weight, almost full weight bearing, but give you the support to not fall. Sir, does it take more time to train with rollators as compared to the other walkers? Because uh, I have seen people transition uh, to a walker very easily, but the minute a rollator is given to them, I've seen it for one or two of my patients. They feel they need time to get used to. Yes, because it's a different it's a different way of walking. You're just following the wall gate pattern. Mm. So that is why it's difficult. So my geriatric patients, my preference is to go from a walker to rolling walker if I need to. Okay. And then and then I never use crutches for my very old patients. Yeah. I saw the use of rollator a lot. Yes. Yeah, we use a rollator a lot. Uh, even some of the hip replacement patients, we might, if they are stable, and if the, if the, if the like, we, if we do a cemented hip replacement, they can go on to rolling rollator walker day one. Mm -hmm. We don't restrict their weight bearing. Now, why do I say that? Is if we use a single, we, we can also do single point cane with weight bearing as tolerated. You know, you're doing, you're still putting a lot of weight on the le leg. But, it can cause tissue inflammation. We do hip replacement protection of weight bearing, not for implant, but for the muscle, protecting the muscles around the hip joint. Mm. Because the implant, if the cemented technique today, in the today's world, mm -hmm. by the time you come out of surgery, you're 95% cured. Okay. You're only doing 5% curing of that cement in the next two weeks or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So you're very stable. It's the it's the uh, it's the patient that has plates and scrotic. That's what worries me more, mm -hmm. and that's the difficult patient. But a younger patient is much easier to manage in terms of how you progress. Their head for mm -hmm. if you do a bone graft for the hip joint, it's very important to protect those 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 joints. Right, and. And it's very important that we understand this whole concept of sheer torsional force and bending movement. Mm -hmm. and I have seen this example. There are lots of, if you go Google search and do a femoral plate failure, of course, the common causes are the screw pulled out, the 